This is Plate Mark. My name is Anne Schaefer and I am your host. This is series three of Plate Mark, which consists of interviews with people who occupy various roles in the print ecosystem. Today's guest is Larissa Goldston. She is the director of ULAE, Universal Limited Art Editions, a storied print shop out on Long Island. Long Island, can you tell I'm from the tri-state? She's a wonderful person to talk to because ULAE has an incredible history and it goes back into the 50s. And its founder, Tatiana Grossman, is a fascinating character. Larissa shares a whole bunch of great stories about her, including several about the French resistance. So you're going to want to hear it. All right, let's see. Housekeeping. My positionality, I identify as a cishet white woman and I use the pronouns she, her. I record Plate Mark in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conway people. Images we talk about will be over on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. You all know this. And also do me a solid and leave me a review. It would really help me out. Okay, let's get rolling. <sighs> Larissa, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for coming on Plate Mark. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, of course, of course. First order of business is for you to introduce yourself for the listeners. My name is Larissa Goldston. I am currently the director of Universal Limited Art Editions, as well as a co-owner. I've been here f- since, well, I grew up here, but I've been here officially in terms of working since 1993. And I think all of you know what ULAE is, or if you don't, I think we're going to dig deeper into that with further questions. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's the first question. What does ULE stand for? Uh, Universal Limited Art Editions, which actually started out as limited art editions in 1955. We actually have a birth certificate in the kitchen. When Tanya was going to officially register the business with the town, a friend of hers had said, if I know you, you'll have prints on the moon at some point. And she said, I think we should be universal. So that's how it transferred from limited art editions to universal limited art editions. I did not know that. That's incredible. Okay. So Tanya, let's start at the beginning. I'm sorry to say we have to do a little history (laughs) because you guys are a storied studio and I think we need to do that. So Tanya is... Okay, she was born to a Russian family. Her father was a typographer in 1904. He was sent by the government of Russia to Siberia to keep an eye on the political situation. And the reason why that's significant is because they were a very well-off family. They lived in a huge home that later during the war, they would commandeer a side of it just to use for political prisoners and for a hospital. And the family's life wasn't disrupted. (laughs) It also happens to have been right down the street from the place where Nicholas II, the Tsar, was assassinated. So they were home at the time of that assassination. Her father was responsible for telling that news story. And when he came home with the paper, military men came and took him away. And when he was delivered back to the house, the paper no longer read that story. And it wouldn't be for another couple of weeks before the public would actually know what happened. And during that time, the father started calculating how to leave the country under understanding that the things were going south very quickly. So they had sewn jewels into their clothes. They had made preparations for leaving. I think they stayed for about six or eight months longer and then departed for Japan, thinking that they would stay there for a year and then come back to Russia. And when they realized that that wasn't going to happen, they started to look into ideas to get visas to Switzerland. And as that became more and more complicated, they landed in Dresden, which is where her mother had been originally from, which is where she went to school. She went to a boarding school there and spent a lot of her time studying Russian authors and starting to feel really committed to the idea of not being a social princess, which her mother really wanted her to be coming from that social status. And so she took to not speaking for two years, totally not speaking. She only wrote letters back and forth with her teachers and ultimately graduated from there and went to the Academy of Applied Arts. 
to become a costume designer because while in Japan, she had been studying costume design. And while she was at the Academy of Applied Arts, won the award for Oriental costume design. While she was there, she met Maurice Grossman, who was a Jewish beatnik artist. And her mother, I guess the story that I didn't tell, which was quite significant, is that her parents were Jewish. Her mother had converted them to Russian Orthodox because she was afraid of what being Jewish was. Her father never did. And Tanya never identified with not being Jewish. She identified very much with being Jewish. And so when she met Maurice, everything for her fell into place. He was really poor. He was really a part of the scene. I mean, he was very close with Zadkine and Lipschitz. They were in Montparnasse in a studio building that actually still exists as a studio building in Paris. And they became part of a tribe. And her mother said to her, if you stay with this man, I will disown you. And she did. And she married him. And the truth was her mother made it here before the war and didn't help them get to America during the war. Her father committed suicide in 1938. Oh my God. At that time, she was living with Maurice in France. They had moved to Paris in late 1929, early 1930, and they were living their life. They had a daughter whose name was Larissa, hence my name, Uh who unfortunately died very young. She died at 16 months old from a double injection of a smallpox shot. Um, oh my goodness! Her to the hospital one night, and when they came back the next morning, she was not alive anymore. So Maurice would say later that that was a blessing in disguise because they never would have been able to cross the Pyrenees on foot um, with a baby. So she started to run underground in Paris as the occupation became clearer and clearer. Started to run for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society from New York, information and money to Jews underground. She said that she always felt that she didn't appear Jewish so she could walk the streets confidently and use that to everyone's advantage. And two days before the occupation of Paris, the guy who ran the auto shop at the end of the block where all of them had their studios took them and a few other Jews underneath a mattress in the back of his pickup truck out towards Marseille. And that's where their journey really began because the truck was stopped and Maurice was taken to a work camp and she went on to Marseille. He found a sympathizer in the camp who sent a letter to her so that she knew where he was. And when she had acquired all the documents, sent for Maurice. And when they arrived, when they brought him back, they then said, oh, we're sorry, you're missing one paperwork, which meant they were headed to the concentration camp. So the two of them took off in the middle of the night with nothing. She had a fur coat and he had a paper signed by a curator at the Louvre saying that he was permitted to be in the mountains copying a Velasquez painting. And so anytime they were stopped, they would just show this letter and they would keep going. And they went through this underground across the Pyrenees on foot from home to home being hidden for many, many months and ended up in Barcelona. Zadkine and Lipschitz and those artists had made it already to the United States and they did their plight here in New York to try to get visas for them to come to the U.S. And together with Eleanor Roosevelt, who was very much a part of the art scene at that point in time, got their visas granted to the U.S. And so in the early 1940s, they arrived in in Philadelphia, where the then CIA, before it was the CIA, I can't remember what it was, interviewed them because they were interested in how Tanya was able to move around, how they escaped, how they were able to escape. And later they would send a letter, which we have, which I think is in the scrapbook, thanking her, saying that the information that they provided is actually what gave the Americans the ability to drop into Paris and move in the underground to be able to take back Paris. What? So, wow. Um, pretty fabulous story on that <laughs> side. <laughs> Um, she lived an incredible life. And then they got to America and they thought, well, what what are we going to do now? And Maurice said, I'm going to teach painting. Tanya thought she'd just be the muse. And then Maurice really went into terrible health. He had a massive heart attack. And she thought, well, I'm going to need to figure out how to make a living for this family. 
1950, they took a trip back to Paris. They wanted to see the apartment, if there was any stuff left, anything of their life. And on that boat trip, they met Larry Rivers. And Tanya fell in love with Larry, not in a not in a sexual way, but in the in the all consuming artist way. Right. Um, and as she was trying to determine what she wanted to do with her life, she was thinking of Libre des Artistes, and she was thinking, "I'd like to do poetry and the images." And she was friends with Harry Abrams, and she thought, "I'll make books, and then I'll sell the rights to Harry, and Harry will make lots of them, and we'll make tons of money." And she thought, well, I only know Larry, so let's start with Larry. And a friend of hers was working at Grove Press, and she said, who's a young poet that I should be working with? And they said, Frank O'Hara. And so Tanya packed up the car, drove out to Southampton to Larry's house and, and said, I have this idea. I'd like for you to be the artist that starts this. And I think that the poet should be a young poet named Frank O'Hara. And he started to laugh at her. And she said, well, why would you laugh at me? He said, Frank, will you come downstairs? Oh, <laughs> was there at the house. They decided it was all divine providence <laughs> and uh, that they would start working together. At the same exact time, they had been looking for a place to live on Long Island and uh, they wanted to escape the heat of the city. They found this little cottage and this man said to them as they were walking to see something else, if you don't find a place to live, come to me. I have a gardener's cottage. You can rent that gardener's cottage. So they did. And um, they ended up renting it for about $8 a month. Oh, As they were standing in the garden, they saw these weird stones that didn't look like regular stepping stones. And they thought, let's dig up these stones. And they did and had no idea what they were. And the next door neighbor came over to say, oh, those are Bavarian lithographic stones. And guess what? I have a lithographic press right next door. So I'll give you, you know, I'll give you the press. If you'll come get it, you can have the press. And another friend said, you know, I know some people who are in printmaking, go to Cooper Union, talk to Bob Blackburn. He knows more than anybody. And so Tanya went in and, and went to Bob and said, I have this press. I want to make this project. Apparently you're the guy to do it. And he thought, she was extremely persuasive and that he'd be there for a couple of months and that would be the end of it. But he was there for five years, not working every day, but working in many occasions. And so he is really the man behind all of the beginning editions of ULAE, those first editions of ULAE. And then he brought in a man by the name of Sigmund Brady, who uh, had been working in the Blackburn studios and was a printmaking major and who then went to the University of Minnesota and was teaching at the University of Minnesota, which is where my father met him as a graduate student in the printmaking department. My father was developing in the late 1960s, mid 1960s, photosensitive stones. And Bob was working on trying to get photos transferred to print to, to stones at that time. Hey, it's Anne popping in to say that there are a couple too many Bobs in the story. And so when Larissa talks about her dad, Bill Goldston, and Bob working on trying to get photos transferred to stones at that time, she's referring to Robert Rauschenberg. And Zig called Tanya and said, there's this kid. He's doing exactly what Bob wants to do. I think we should bring him out to the to the studio. And that's sort of how that history started. Well, <laughs> that was longer, but <laughs> no, it's fat. Well, I mean, I knew Tanya was an amazing person. I've read, uh, you know, enough to know that, but I, I've forgotten all that early stuff. That's incredible. She had an extraordinary, an extraordinary life. Hard. Yeah. Extraordinary. Right. Did, did they ever figure out why those stones were buried in the backyard? No. No, nope. and there were only two, so it made not a whole lot of sense. But once she understood what those were, then she was going to, she had my father going to and Zig going to any any newspaper place that was going out of business, they'd go and they'd collect them or universities who no longer needed them. Or, and I mean, everything was done on, on those stones at one point in time, everything. So labels, cigar labels, shoe labels, everything was done. So all of those stones on the backs of them tell another story completely from the other side that we're using as well. And James Sienna in a project not, not many years ago, turned them over to those sides and started using those as the basis of images and then started drawing on top of them. So they nice. have this sort of double history. Oh, that's cool. 
The only problem, though, there is that once you use those images and draw on top of them and you want to do another, <laughs> it's just poof, gone. gone. <laughs> well, the, the number of artists that want to work on stones now these days seems to be less and less as we grow, but we, we still do it. We still do. Yeah. So for how long was the shop only lithography? Etching came in, I think it was 1964 five was when they first she got a it might be 1966 she got a grant from what was the national endowment of the arts before it was national endowment of the arts i'm not remembering the name right off the top of my head to be able to establish that studio and and that's how she was able to work with barnett um and everybody tried it most people didn't like it but i mean lee bontaku had tried it and helen had tried it and um Cy twombly made one portfolio called sketches and he made um a few of the other untitled in that but generally it wasn't huge the overwhelming response wasn't to it. People still wanted to make lithos. I think it was easier and more direct for them, but it was consistent at that point in time. So I think it was 1966. Okay. It makes sense because the artists that ended up being sort of the bread and butter of ULAE seemed to me to be um, painters first. Yes. Right. And so lithography and its its autographic nature would be, that would make sense. So what was interesting was, you know, everybody was working on stones. So pre-1971, everybody was working on the transfer litho press. So they only had that one transfer litho press. And then when my father got here, when Bill did, he had been working in the army. He had been drafted in the army before he actually got to work here. And he learned to work every commercial press that was out there. So he convinced Tanya that buying a offset lithographic press would offer them the opportunity to produce books. So Jasper had been working on zero through nine, and the idea was to make that into a book. And so Bill was working over at another studio, which he had procured for them because they'd grown out of this space that was in the house. Downstairs was the etching studio and upstairs was the litho studio. They'd outgrown it. They got a letter press and they had an offset lithographic press. Jasper was working one day on decoy, which was an evolution of passage. And everything, if you remember, for litho has to be drawn backwards. So artists would work with mirrors. They'd, they'd find their own ways to figure out how to get the image to be the way they wanted it. And Bill had come for lunch, and they were discussing what this possibility was. And he was showing Tanya the possibilities of these offsets that he was working on. And Jasper said, can you take me there? I want you to show me that. And he became completely consumed with the idea that he could draw the image as you wanted to see the image. And so he no longer had to work backwards. And Tanya was apoplectic because she associated the offset press with posters and, and newspapers and thought that people would no longer take them seriously. And she just spent 10 years just trying to figure out how to get them to take her seriously for the work that she was making. But Jasper said, I don't want to hear another word of it. And, and post-1971, he never made a print on anything other than that offset press and then in and then in etching um huh. so, so that was revolutionary for for a number of artists I, i'm always fascinated by how intertwined the commercial and the artistic production are in the equipment because the artists have to work to convince people that the offset is you know legit quote unquote or whatever and it's it's just so funny because it's it's all the same method of making it's just intention right Absolutely. It's just actually one more step. It has nothing to do with anything different that the artist does other than they're not drawing backwards. Right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think people understand that more when they do tours and they see how things work, then, then it, a, a light bulb goes off in the brain and they're able to understand it more. Did you grow up on Long Island? Was your dad there full time? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, you were I, the studio rat. I, I was the studio rat. You know, we were having this conversation the other day. Some people love the smell of gasoline. They, they you know, they get up on that. Lithotine is my thing. So I could sit and sniff lithotine all day. Um, and I, it's because I was sponging for my father. It was the only way I got to see him. So, you know, we moved here in, it, this is dating me. Uh, we moved here in, in the spring of 1971, right after I had been born. Another interesting thing was when I was born, Bill called Tanya to say, I've had a baby girl. And she said, do you have a name for her? And he said, 
no, I don't yet have a name for her. And she said, how about Larissa? And he loved the name, but they didn't know the background of the story for years. It wouldn't be until I was eight or nine that they actually found out the background of that story. Oh, wow. So um, anyway, he had moved us here in that spring and started working full time. and, And it really was a very small operation at that point in time. And it was sort of a cast of characters that were working sometimes and not working sometimes. And, and you know, none of the papers matched. If, if you get an edition from the 1960s, early 70s with, with 30 sheets that matched, you were really, really lucky because it didn't happen. You know, they took what they had and they did what they had. And so Bill started trying to streamline everything and make it all more focused on how to find details and keep records and such. So he was very involved in every aspect of the business. And by the time Maurice died in 1976, Tanya said, you know, my heart in that way is not in this without Maurice. And you really need to take over the operations of the studio and I will continue to be the face as long as I can be the face and the relationships and that sort of thing. But I really, I, I need you to just do this. Wow. And so that's what he felt. And so I essentially lost my father in some ways to this business, but I was always here. Tanya was my godmother. I was always spending time here with her, with him, with the artists um, so that I could see my dad. Where's your mom in this story? not present. I mean, she was very (laughs) present in my life, but not. So she was, um, she was working. I mean, you know, times were tough then financially. My parents were poor and um, there wasn't a lot of money in printmaking at that time. And so my mom was teaching and she was trying to uh, beforehand had tried to help put my father through graduate school um, by teaching and that sort of thing. So she was being a parent and, and working and trying to make ends meet and was less interested in the whole art world scene than someone else would have been maybe. <laughs> The rest of the family. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so she was present, but not, she was not really part of the, the scene. Okay. Do you have siblings? I do. I have an older brother from that marriage and then, and then Bill's married to a woman named Ricardo Decker, who's an artist and they have two children. So I have two half siblings from that marriage as well. Gotcha. But you're sitting in the director's chair at ULAE. (laughs) Yes. um, They had, (laughs) they had wiser thoughts about. (laughs) Um, They were smarter. Um, um, (laughs) My older brother is a, as a web developer and a creative and has his own life and career. And my two younger siblings, you know, it was very different. When I grew up, like I said, breathing, living, knowing this, and I knew Tanya, and it was sort of a destiny situation for me to be there. They came into the picture much later, and it was a different life, and Bill and Ricardo, Ricardo's Italian, so they were traveling back and forth to Italy, and so they're not as attached. Conceptually, they're attached to the idea because of so much of what my father's done in the world of printmaking, um, but never became a workaholic. I mean, I was working here by the time I was 12 and I was working on the Jasper Johns catalog Raisonne and I was doing research and I was taking the bus from Bayshore to West Islip. It was a very different way of growing up, I think, which is why I just by default came into it. I mean, my father tried to discourage me from doing it. He did? Well, he just said, you know, it's a really hard life. It's not, this is not an easy path. And what we do does not afford you the opportunity to live a a high lifestyle. So if that's what you're after, don't don't do this. Um, But I was infected from a very young age about being around artists, watching them, the creative energy that happens. I could never say that I was an artist, but I am extremely creative. And being around that energy in the studio is everything I want. You know, it's my food. It's my soul food. Ah, well said. Yeah, I didn't think you were a maker, but clearly in order to be in the seat that you're in, you have to have a creative brain, you know, to at least to relate to what everyone's trying to make. (laughs) But it is a business too. So you have to have, you really have to have it all. Well, I have the knowledge. That's, I mean, I'm present as artists are working through every project, 
But if you stuck me in a room and asked me to make a photogravure, even though I have the step-by-step directions on how to do it, I don't think it would come out very good. Um, I wouldn't be doing it for someone. But I I do know all of the technical practices that are involved, Um, as did, well, actually, Tanya really didn't. She didn't really care. She just wanted the creative energy, and she hired people who helped her do that. Bill had the unique ability to make the work and run the business, and that's why he was so desired by so many people to work with, because there, there aren't many people like him in the world. And so he had these magical, really magical working relationships with these, with these artists and they were discovering things all at the same time. The artist that Tanya brought in, was Bill free to go out and make relationships of of his own? And when did that kind of uh, switch over to his control? So no, he, um, he would not have taken that role while Tanya was alive. So up until 1982, when she passed, it really was her. There was a deep, deep love and respect among the two of them. And she was the reason that everybody was there or not there. I mean, she did have falling outs with artists at that time. And, you know, I think Klaus Oldenburg is famous for saying, I already have a mother. I don't oh. <laughs> Um, so I think he only made one project here. Uh, I've forgotten that one. (laughs) And I think she and Helen had a, had a falling out and I can't remember if that was financial. I mean, there were different things that were at play. So in 1982, when she passed away, she left the business to three silent partners and then half of it to Bill with the idea that no one person could control it. So if if Bill were to go off the rails, then these other three people would be there to make sure that it it was actually following her idea. That was when he said, well, I have, she left him with a a huge debt of about uh, $750,000. Oh my goodness. So uh, he had a big hole to dig out of and he thought I need to start working with some people. And so he relied on influence from some of the older artists and suggestions and then he just started going with his gut. He went to school with Bill Jensen at the University of Minnesota. So Bill was one of the first artists that he asked to come out. And Della Hunte Gallery in Texas had a show of Terry Winters and he'd gotten a mailer for it. And he was totally in love with the work and, and flew down there and sort of, you know, wanted to work with Terry right away. And I think Terry and Tip were, Carol Dunham were very good friends. And so that sort of happened. And He had met Susan Rothenberg and was in love with that work. And Susan and Elizabeth Murray were very close friends. And so it's always happened in that very organic way that everyone comes through some sort of serendipitous relationship in one form or another. There have been off-the-cuff invitations, but, but rarely. I always ask people like you, how does a young artist, you know, get in, quote unquote? Some people are open to cold calls, but so many times it's like, well, it's all, you know, it's a super organic process and, you know, don't try. (laughs) We'll find you. (laughs) I know how disappointing that is for people who are out there, but the truth is um, that's how the magic is made. From a true point, like from a heart point of view, that is how the magic is made. It's very organic. And it's rare that we've had people come into the studio and they don't fit in because it's rare that you get past that initial visit to the studio and the lunch and you sort of know it's either going to work or it doesn't work. And Carol Dunham was out yesterday and he's doing a project that we're, we're doing to raise money for a book that he was publishing. And he said, I want to pull these images from this last project. And they said, we already have them out and this is what we were thinking. And he's like, you just get me. So there's something about working with someone that you understand, you get inside their brain, you know what they need before they even know what they need. And that is special and you cannot make that happen. You cannot force that situation. So I think that people who work with us know that and then have that feeling from somebody else who might be in their life and then arrange a studio visit for us to do that with them. And and so it's already churning in its way. So I, I don't think, at least maybe with Tanya, but not with us, there's ever been like a cold call that's kind of worked out for anyone. Who, who do you have working in the shop as, as printers these days? The printers? Mm-hmm. So Bruce Wankel, who's been here for many, many, many years, is still on staff. And then a gentleman named Jason Miller, who came to us 
from Tamarind and he came many years ago, then he left and then he came back. And then Brian Berry is my studio manager and person that makes it all happen. And he's the etching genius behind everything. He trained under Craig Zamiello. And so he was a photography guy and that's still really his interest. And photography is really very much his interest, but he's a creative solver and thinker and, and a really charming and sweet and kind person. And then I have a young woman named Andrea who came to us from a former printer named Lorena Salcedo Watson, who worked here for many years and was responsible for a lot of the Elizabeth Murray projects and the Jane Hammond clown suit and all these kind of crazy three-dimensional that only a woman could come up with. Um, Andrea studied under Lorena and Lorena called and said, I have this incredible woman and I think you should try to have her in the studio. And, and, and we do. And then we have another young guy who came to us from Cornell via Magnolia and he was here for a couple of years and now is, is leaving and, and pursuing his own career in art. Well, so w really what you're saying is that it in addition to it being an organic process to find artists to do projects with, the finding of printers and technical staff is also almost the same. Almost exactly the same. And honestly, it's really hard to find someone. It's really hard to find a printer. It's really hard to find a printer because either printers are working on their own, you know, like Greg Burnett, who's fabulous, or Maurice, those guys who are doing it. But to find somebody else who's young and thoughtful and in that world who wants to be in the studio environment, because like I said, there's not a lot of money in this. It's it's hard. It's hard. And it's hard to, to come into this situation because we are a family. We eat together every single day. You know, we have, we know each other's families and lives and and it's very intimate. So it is hard to break into that. So that definitely comes from organic. We've had some cold calls. We did. We had one guy who worked for us, Stevie, who's now down at Flying Horse, you know, walked in the door and was like, I want to work for you. He was either Temple or Philadelphia College of Art and just said, can I work here for the summer? And then came back and started working for us. And he was amazing. It's just that he decided he wanted to move to Florida. Well, yes, ha things happen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> life intervenes. Exactly. So, and you guys have a showroom of, of some nature in the city, in Chelsea. How does that function? Uh, it's actually in Flatiron. So it's a little further east. It's on 20th between 5th and 6th. Um, and Marie is there. Marie Tennyson is my director of sales and she runs that space. It's small, but it gets the job done. It has beautiful windows and light and we run rotating exhibitions that are tiny. And then we have a flat file there. So we're able to show and that helps a lot. It used to be in the old days when nobody had anything to do, uh, they would take the train out or drive out to Long Island and spend the day and have lunch. And But everybody's so busy now that I think it was a necessity for us to have the space. And I had the gallery from 2005 to 2012 and, you know, showed ULE exhibitions and, and showed prints there. But that just wasn't, it, we weren't able to keep that going. The financial um, burden of having a real gallery in the city is, is very complicated and and, you know, we're not selling expensive prints. The, the majority are somewhere between 1500 and, and 7500 at max. I mean, there are the exclusions like Jasper Johns. Jasper Johns, right. Jasper Johns. <laughs> it's not selling for $7,500. No. But, um, but those are fewer and fewer. And, you know, Jasper's not really making prints. I mean, he's 93 and he's making decisions and, and he's not certainly not churning them out like he was in the 60s you know, keeping the doors open is the most important priority. And, and so we make accommodations to ensure that we can keep that going. One of the things that I wanted to do with the podcast, with this series in particular, was to open up the world of people like you and the situation. And because, you know, the Geminis and the ULEs are, you know, up here in the pinnacles of these storied print shops, but it's, it's, it's a real working place and it's a place where you have to keep working and it's not you can't just say hey we're the you know ULE of Tanya's time like it's it's work it's work it is non-stop living breathing life work and I think it's easier for me because this is my family and my choice and 
and you know, I own it. So that's very different than asking my printers to be here until nine o'clock at night when an artist has finished working and, you know, they should be celebrating doing something else or someone's expecting them at home. So it, it's hard and you're at the whims of others, but I think people really do it because they love it. We really love what we do. Um, and that energy that happens when you go, yes, we got it is really fabulous and it fills you with a great sense of joy and to know that those then will be hanging on someone else's wall at some point in time and filling them with that amount of joy makes it all worth it do you ever fire artists (laughs) i I, not so much fire i think relationships change and um I, i think it's usually equal so i mean you know, most of the artists that have been here are lifers. So we don't, people came and went more in the earlier days than they have in the following days. But, you know, Susan Rothenberg worked here for years and then she moved away and she was in New Mexico. And so it was harder for her to come. You know, Elizabeth Murray and Jim Rosenquist stayed working until their dying days, actually. And Jasper and Bob and all of those people stayed all the way through. And and many people are very loyal. It's a special working environment here. We try to give artists every single thing that they need so that they never are left wanting. And if they are, then they work at another studio where they find that. That was the beauty of having multiple studios and artists working at multiple studios because Jasper could come here and have one working experience and go to Simca and have one working experience and go to Gemini. And those are beautiful relationships that I think are less understood now than they were then. Yeah, there might be a perception that you're cheating on the other shop. And I'm with you. I'm like, the more the merrier. Let's do it. Well, I think Tanya felt very much like people were cheating on her and and also didn't want to share secrets. And I think that the older Gemini crew probably felt the same way. But I think there's power in numbers. And I think if we find a way to support and lift up each other, then we shouldn't need to be competitive with one another because we're all doing different things. You know, if you look at the work that an artist produces at ULAE and you look at the work that that same artist produces at Gemini or Two Palms or Polygraphia or wherever it might be, they're very different looks. And that is why an artist does it. So they have that chance to see that. So if people would embrace that idea, then I think we'd be a lot better off. And some of us do, and some of us don't. It's just... Sure, sure. The other thing that's changed also is that I feel like back in the 60s, there was kind of an obvious pyramid of artists. Right. Um, and and the internet has so dilute, not diluted in a bad way, but just spread so many more people out so that Bob and Jasper, you know, there's a hundred bazillion of those two guys and and nobody can get the airtime because there's so many. You know what I mean? Yes. It's a challenge, I think. It's a challenge and it's a challenge to get people to work because this object has destroyed people's (laughs) focus and desire to quiet down and take time to do something else. Popping in to say that when Larissa says this object, she's holding up her iPhone. So I find that just being able to even get a meeting with some of these artists that I am desperate to work with is next to impossible because they are being pulled in so many directions, whether it be a museum show or a gallery or a, or their own studio working or they're in a different country or they're at a residency. or I mean, everyone is so busy now. You know, before we had these devices, like I was saying, people didn't have anything better to do. Let's go go to Long Island and have a party at ULAE. That's so fabulous. And every curator would show up and every museum director would show up and every dealer would show up because there was nothing else to do. Now there's so much happening that there's no way to spread yourself. So finding artists that are committed to making prints, I mean, there's probably hundreds, right, that I'm not working with, but I mean, 
those that I have my eye on for whatever reason, that's not saying that there aren't a hundred good ones, but I have this desire to really work with some people who I feel like would translate very well to prints who may have never made one. Um, it's hard. It's hard to get them out here and working, but you know, I think once they do and they get into it, that's the that's the beauty. That's the goal. That's when you're like, ha ha, I got them hooked. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, we have some artists right now that are working that are like that, and who never imagined they would be, but they are. Mm. And that's that's fantastic. That's, you that's you cool. we have like parallel lives, I swear, because I'm I'm always talking about just getting not the artists, but just the um, admirers and museum goers and buyers and collectors over the technical speed bump. Yes. Of in, of understanding. I'm always saying, you know, I once I get you in here. <laughs> I finally get it. Exactly. Um, but it is techno speak, and Bill is known for verbal diarrhea as far as techno. <laughs> is concerned because he can talk and spew these terms and you kind of lose your audience in that. But when you're, when they're able to actually see it and then the techno speak becomes interesting because they know what's happening. But if you, if you can't visualize or you don't know what's happening, that's a harder hump. Yeah. So um, the more education people have, the more into prints they would be, or they are. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever take a break? Are you going on vacation? We take a break every summer. Uh, we go away in August for the month to Italy. So yes, that's my rejuvenating time. We hike a lot and we then go to the sea and we don't think about a lot of work. And my team here is extraordinary and can keep it going. And then I have the fuel to do it for another year. Okay. So, yeah. I'm sure the pandemic changed a lot of how you maneuver through the world. Have you reduced the number of fairs you're doing? How has it changed with the pandemic? Well, COVID was really interesting for us because one, we're lucky enough that we're out of the city. So we have 15,000 square feet out here between two buildings. So even if I have 10 people, we can well social distance. We closed for the first couple of months and then everybody started filtering back. We did alternate days. We were in different studios. The lucky thing for us was we had a lot going before the pandemic hit. So we were in production mode. And so we had a ton of Christopher Wools that we were printing. We had some Charlene Von Hiles that we were printing. Eddie Martinez thought he could come and work. And as long as you know, everybody was sort of masked up and he made a whole group of monoprints during that time. So we didn't suffer as much as some did that, you know, sort of do project by project. We do a ton of projects all at once and then we go into, you know, production mode. So it, it wasn't as bad for us as it could have been. It's just been harder getting artists who don't know us yet, those that I was talking about, into the studio because they didn't know what our practices were or they didn't trust us or that not not meaning they didn't know to trust us. They just didn't know us at that point in time. So that I think the challenge of getting people out here post COVID is more complicated. But, you know, during the summers, we have a lot of people coming because they're going out east to their homes. And so they can travel one way or the other going back and forth. But um, we haven't really changed our practices that much. And we only ever did two to three fairs anyway. So we we're I'm on the board of the IFPDA. So we always do IFPDA. And um Miami we did. And, and years ago, we tried out, but the fair model doesn't seem to work really well for us. A lot of our work is challenging and needs education. And it isn't pretty stuff that goes on the wall. It can be some complicated things. And so we find more that going from place to place and, and working with people directly and bringing work to homes works a little bit better for us as a model. And I would say that the online sales thing has ramped up considerably, since oh. COVID, which has changed for us, which was never a model by which we had. But then we have a very strong um, person who works for us, a younger person who works for us doing all of our social media and is building. So I wouldn't even know. I don't even know the language. So <laughs> she makes some kind of Instagram, TikTok, whatever she does. And she's making these incredible videos of the people working in the studio and they're, <laughs> they're crowd pleasers. I mean, when Eddie's in the studio, it's like 400,000 people are clicking through. And when Kiki's in the studio, same thing. It's, it's, it's crazy. So I don't know any of that. I leave all that to her. Lucky you. Because yes, I'm a one-man band over here. 
<laughs> God forbid. I'm glad you know how to do that stuff because I don't. Uh, I, I I refuse to get on TikTok. No. I, I no. just I don't think my audience is there, so I'm not doing it. You'll be banned before you get there anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Can you think of a project that was super difficult or complicated or took, you know, way too long? Huh. Where do you think? <laughs> Um, I mean, just look at the prints that we've made over the years. You know, you go look at Elizabeth Murray project, look at the print called Shack, which was 143 plates, 28 colors, 14 sheets of paper, and took a month to put together one just oh. for her to look at, to be like, no, I want to make three more plates. The Jane Hammond clown suit, which is actually a clown suit that you can put a body into, you know, that's hand sewn, that's stitched. Those were crazy projects that were of that time period. So late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s. Kiki's made some pretty crazy projects as well. More recently, Wyatt Khan just made a reduction woodcut, which was one of the largest prints that we've made in a very long time, which was extremely complicated to, to print. You know, Lisi Skavich has, has always been an amazing and very rewarding challenge for us because learning to work with her in color because she's such an extraordinary colorist and getting her out of the black and white comfort zone of, of printmaking and into a color zone. She and Bill worked for a couple of years on, on figuring that out, but was so rewarded with the results that came out of that. And now they're not as complicated to put... To, I mean, Wyatt, again, has done another project for, with us, which I guess is the most complicated, and we haven't printed it yet because we haven't actually figured out how to print it. <laughs> because it's 18 panels on one sheet, and every single panel is a different form of printmaking, but it all has to be printed at once. Gotcha. So we're, that's, a, that's a tough one. Yeah. I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> On the Wyatt reduction woodcut, and I, I know this varies from artist to artist, but did he direct the, the design and then the studio is doing the carving as they're printing it? He comes back and carves. He's carving it every single time. And I, like, that's one of those things I was saying. Jordan is the, my my social media like web person, was videoing it every single time he was doing it. So you can follow it. You can see that. He's the only one who touched that woodblock. We didn't. We didn't. Oh. Wow. Do that. Wow. How big is it? Huge. It's like 70 by 58 or something like that. Ooh, it's, yikes. It's big. Yeah. I mean, Rauschenberg's Soviet American Arrays. No, actually, Suzanne McClelland made a print back in 96, I think, called Tea Leaves. Might have been earlier. That was seven feet by nine feet. That's the <laughs> largest print we've ever made. Monsters. Oh. I think what we say is, People can make prints anywhere. People come to us to make projects um, ah. that that we're sort of figure them out in a different way. Gotcha. Huh. So, Do you uh, have a favorite print? Or, <laughs> or what's um, hanging above your bed at home? <laughs> oh, hanging above my bed at home is a set of Christopher Wool's. But uh, I think if I were to pick my favorite, I mean, I don't even need to think it is my favorite print of all time, which is a James Rosenquist print called dog descending a staircase. I desperately wanted it for years. And my husband surprised me a few years ago and found it at an auction in perfect condition and bought it and gave it to me as an anniversary present. And ULE did print it, but we just didn't, we didn't have them, you know, left for me to sort of take and put on my wall. <laughs> Now that is happily displayed on my wall. I mean, I just love every every single surface in my house is covered with a piece of art. There's not, I mean, every bathroom, every every place is covered. I just love being around art. Well, it's it's easy to do with prints, right? Especially if you're in a shop. Do you collect backwards in time or is it all contemporary, mostly ULAE? No, I have I have an amazing John Newman that was a Ken Tyler piece that's a massive sculpture that he made. Um, we have Suzanne McClellan drawings. We have, I mean, Matt Bay Levenstein paintings. We have Erica Sveck and Zach Waller paintings and drawings, Mark Fox's. I mean, we've, we've collected, my husband loves art as well. And that's what sort of drew us together. So we love collecting. We just um, need more money. <laughs> 
than, than wall space. <laughs> yeah, exactly. we're definitely out of wall space, but my husband's like, we'll figure out a place to put it. Let's build some shelves and we'll stick them on the shelf. <laughs> so ULAE's archive is held where? For 1957 to 1982 is at the Art Institute of Chicago. That was a deal that was negotiated prior to Tanya's death. And Esther Sparks had been working on a catalog for years called The First 25 Years. And so they hold that collection. They do not have the second half of the collection and don't have that intentionality to do that. I think it was such a huge undertaking to take the first half and they built a whole study center. And, and I mean, they have plates and archival sheets and everything you could possibly imagine. We still sent them stuff even last year that we found the Bontecu plates. And I think James Rondo's like, really, do we need more? We're still trying to work on figuring out who will have the second round of the archive. Okay. All right. Hear you, hear you. <laughs> so right now we're still here. I mean, it's still yeah. here. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, plenty of places just send, you know, every couple of years, whatever the most recent, I mean, it's possible. It doesn't have to be a lump sum of things, right? It doesn't have to. I mean, I I don't know how it works with everybody else. And I right. know that, you know, Gemini, I think is at the National Gallery and, and Ken is also there. And so, you know, maybe, who know, I don't know what makes sense. I right, know. right. Wow. Well, good luck finding that because <laughs> clearly it needs to happen. <laughs> eventually it does need to happen. Yeah, <laughs> eventually. All right. Well, so what's, uh, what's on the horizon for you? Anything that we should know about? There are tons of fun things happening in the studio right now. Eddie Martinez is back and working and he's doing incredibly fun, amazing, large mono monotypes. Actually, we had been looking at the Jasper monotypes after he started working on these and you know, that got his fine thinking. And we're working towards an addition brand. His, his working process does not lend itself as well towards additioning because he works quickly and, and does, it, it takes a lot of patience to make a lithograph or an etching for that matter. So he's working on that. So he's working on them at the same time so that he's able to fill his downtime. And then um, Julia Rommel's in the house again, which is incredible. And she also was working on monos. It sounds like we're working on a lot of monos, but it turns out that working on Manos helps work through what we're doing in the edition. So she started with Manos and now we've finally evolved into what we're doing for the edition. And there's some beautiful Manos that are coming out of that. Really interesting. We're folding copper and printing folded copper. And so that's really fun and interesting and not like anything we've done before, which is kind of exciting. And then Sam Moyer's working in the studio again this summer. And she's always interesting because she had made prints before and she's bringing in, you know, slabs of marble that she's etched and we're printing those and they're breaking in the press. And then she's putting them back onto the press and layering them. And so that's interesting. And then we have, who else do we have working? We have a set of Christopher Wools we're working on and a, a group of Charlene Von Hiles that we're also working on, which are really fun. Tip is back, Carol Dunham's back in the studio and we're doing another print. We just finished a portfolio with him, which was at the Oslo, the National Museum in Oslo had a beautiful print show of all of his portfolios that just um, was up. And Martin Purrier is working on a project for Storm King, which then we'll work on another project together. And we're doing a Joe Bradley um, benefit for studio in a school, which will evolve into something else as well. So we've got a ton of things happening in the studio. So it's always, it's always an adventure here. <laughs> I can imagine. Yes. You guys must have some serious energy. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> What do you think I take a month off in August? Yeah, right. Exactly. So my, my last question for you, and I meant to ask it earlier, and I'm sorry, we're going to go back in time a smidge, but accident. Yes. Can you tell us the story about what happened and how they made it all work in the end? Well, that was touchy. Oh. Um, <laughs> No, well, because history has been rewritten a number of times, but that was a stone that Bob had made with Bob Blackburn and um, likely the pressure on the press was too much. Bob Blackburn was completely beside himself when that happened. And Bob Rauschenberg thought, well, you know, maybe it happened for a reason. And so he said, pick it up and let's just put it back into place and let's see what serendipitous 
event comes out of it. And that is how accident came to be. And I don't think they ever thought accident was going to be what accident became, which was this monumental historical piece. I just think Bob thought, I like that image, pick it up and let's keep trying to print it. And I think that ultimately, as my father tells it, that Bob Blackburn was so mortified by that, that that was sort of the end of Bob Blackburn working here. Now, he still did work here some, but I think he never really got over. And that was artist to artist. So that, I mean, that was his heart hurting that he had. And anybody who's ever made a print has has lost something. You know, I remember my father and he was like losing a Helen Frankenthaler stone and thinking like it can go so fast. It can black out so fast if you're not there to catch it. And and so sometimes chemistry, you know, which, you know, Tamron teaches chemistry and those printers that come out of there are amazing chemists. But the minute something goes astray from that, they're they're not sure that their brains can, it's like their brains misfire because they're used to being in it. And I think the less training you have, the more you can save something, um, the more you can let your brain go, you can allow it to save something. And it may end up being something different, but it doesn't have to necessarily be a loss. Right. So I try to encourage that mentality. Well, that's clearly what happened with accident. But the follow on to accident, I'm sorry, back to accident. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, but there's a second stone, there's a second black with a little puddle at the bottom of the crack. Did they transfer the image to another stone and add that second element? No, that was all part of the original stone that broke. So they picked up the elements. I mean, I'd have to look again just to ref- refresh my mind. On oh, which- I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that to you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Usually I have my book all with me so that I could talk you, you, you through it. But, you know, even, you know, no one was here. No one was in the studio at that time besides Bob and Bob because that was even pre-Bill. That was pre-my dad in the studio. And the information that we have on that is in Tony Toll's writings and in Tony, who was the secretary at the time, who was also a poet. So I'd have to look back on exactly what you're talking about, but you must have a story that I'm not... Do you know a story that I don't remember? Uh, well, I, I recently had a <clears throat> excuse me, a guest on, uh, Michael Barnes, who's a, a lithographer yeah. and big fan, right? And his theory was that they that Bob Blackburn managed to get the printed two halves of the stone done, but that there was a second black element added that must have, they must have transferred the broken stone image to another stone and added that last bit so that it, that's his theory. So I was checking with you because that was his theory. Do you have any follow-ups to your interviews on podcasts? Because that might be like part two. Okay, sure. (laughs) Um, because I do think your viewers and your listeners should know the answer to that, but that I would have to do a little, I'd have to go back and look, um, and then look into the notes of what, and see if we have the notes and what happened. Hey, everybody, it's Anne breaking in to say that Larissa followed up with me not too long after we had this conversation via email with the answer to the question straight from the ULAE's archives. So here's what she reported on accident. Bob Rauschenberg made an image on the stone. They, Rauschenberg and Blackburn, printed it and the stone broke after a couple of images were pulled. They threw that stone away along with those pulled images and Rauschenberg made another stone, which they printed and it broke too after only three impressions. So Rauschenberg instructed Blackburn to put the pieces together and they secured them in place. Rauschenberg added another little fracture of a stone at the bottom where that little pile of extra stuff shows up in a different black with that additional image, which he called the debris. And then they printed the addition. And apparently bits and pieces continue to break off during the printing. So there are slight variations among the addition of 29. So mystery solved. Thank you so much, Larissa, for following up with me and our listeners, who I'm sure (laughs) were just sitting on the edges of their seats trying to figure out what the heck happened. All right, back to the show. Well, I mean, the other thing is you've had me, but I mean, having Bill, you know, you would but have the time of your life having some of the stories from Bill of working on decoy with Jasper and Bob and working in the, you know, figuring out how to do these photo transfers. And the stories are unbelievable. And Helen and, you know, how Savage Breeze came about and how East and Beyond came about. And those are some of her most incredible woodcuts. 
you know, it's a wealth of information. I keep saying to him, you need to, you need to record these so that we have them because he's sort of like the last of the generation left. I, yeah, I wasn't sure if he had let it all go when he retired and, and whether I should bug him. <laughs> well, he's not around very much, but maybe that's part two. Okay. <laughs> deal. <laughs> all right. Well, Larissa, thank you so much for telling us all these wonderful <laughs> stories about ULE. Is there a movie that somebody made about Tanya's early life? There should be. Well, you know, I, I've always wanted to write that book. Reva Castleman did the scrapbook, which sort of documents it all, but really write the historical fiction kind of idea. Of yeah. Um, and so you never know, maybe that's to come. Who knows? All right. Screenplay to come. <laughs> <laughs> And your free time. Exactly. And all the free time that I have. Exactly. Don't pull that. I've got another paragraph to write. Um, (laughs) I am so honored to be on this. And thank you so much for including me and thinking me worthy. And I love what you're doing. It's super fun for all of us to listen to. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate those kind words. Thanks. Of course. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to this episode with Larissa Goldston. I think she's an amazing person and ULAE is worth a visit. Let's see. I need to thank Larissa for being such a wonderful guest and a thank you as usual to Michael Diamond for the use of his original music and a special thank you to Dan Fury, my sound guy. My God, do I need a sound guy? Thank you so much, Dan, for all your help images are over on platemarkpodcast.com you know that and um let's see there's a support and donate button over there you can help a woman out and support the good work of me the person who does platemark it's just me all right i think that's it we'll see you next time